APU. American Public University is proud to present Leading Forward. I'm Dr. Ashley Taylor. In this episode, we're going to discuss entrepreneurship and creative vision. I have with me Dr. Wanda Presley, and I want to thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Presley, tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background. My professional background includes a bachelor's and master's degree in criminal justice and a PhD in organization management. I've spent the last 15 years of my professional career working as a social worker in child abuse and neglect out of the state of Florida. But for the last nine years, I've spent my time working as a professor and a consultant with doctoral students that are trying to graduate from college. And most of my students, they are struggling in some way with their program, trying to get through their program. And so they reach out to me asking for assistance with helping them with their writing and their methodology with regards to their current study. So most of my students are those that are struggling in some sort of way. Um, I have other avenues that I also dabble in as well. I have a, an athletic clothing line, and I also am an author, and, and I write children's stories as well. That's very multifaceted. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide to take a non-traditional route to employment or to move away from that social worker aspect of things? 15 years as a social worker dealing with child abuse and neglect is a lot. I can only imagine. Yeah, the average stay is usually about six months. So I stayed in 15 years, and um, I think I, I did my, my bit for king and, and country at that point. So I needed to have something that was a little different, that didn't have me struggling to sleep at night and dealing with other people's issues. And so I wanted to teach, and I had already had my master's degree, and I had dabbled in a little teaching at that point, but I really wanted to go further. So I felt that I needed to have more of an education in order to do that. So that's why I went after my PhD. I was just challenged in what I wanted to do with my PhD. So I decided to look at something that was more business related. And I wanted to look at how the government, how they handed out money to private organizations and how that money was being spent. So I've spent a lot of time doing research and writing about how cost matters, how the government gives money to private organizations and what they do with it and how that impacts our society. Okay. So you stepped away from social work, but you still really kept that social consciousness and everything still going. Oh, absolutely. Because I think that, you know, we have a responsibility as citizens to always ask the question. And so when you hand a, a private organization a $74 million contract, someone should be asking the question, so what'd they spend the money on, <laughs> you know? And if they can't tell you what they spent the money on, it's like, I don't understand how that works. Because in every aspect of our lives, government is always asking the people to verify things that they have. And so this doesn't make any sense why our social services and agencies are blowing through so much money and we're having such a hard time trying to understand where this money is going. Yeah. Accountability is absolutely necessary in that area. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your current business. You mentioned your consulting and you mentioned your clothing line. There's so many things you're writing. So, you know, pick up whichever one you want to start with and we'll explore. Well, my company, uh, Absolute Management and Coaching Services, is the primary organization that I'm with. And with regards to AMCS, like I said, I work with college students that are struggling to get out of their doctoral program. A lot of the people that come to me come to me with a challenge that they are currently having with their study, but also with their life. I have a lot of students that come with medical issues. I surprisingly have students that are dealing with life-ending medical issues and they want to finish their study. And they are asking for help because they may not have another two years to finish it. So they want to get some sort of direction on what's the best way to go about doing things. So I spend a lot of time with that. I have a unique array of clientele all the way from your elementary school teacher to someone working in the White House. It just really just depends on what the situation is and why they are going after their degree. 
So it's a lot of fun. I really do enjoy it because there are a lot of different studies that we get to go through and I get to learn new things myself. And it's never boring by any means. And so we spend a lot of time doing the research and finding the information. And it gives them an opportunity to have someone to lean on as opposed to feeling like they're doing it all by themselves. So it works well for us. And so I've been doing that part of the organization for nine years. I also work with uh, small businesses that are trying to get off the ground, needing a little bit of extra help with their marketing or with developing plans for staff, coming up with new ideas in order to maintain staff, to keep them from turning over. Of course, right now with COVID, we're in such a unique situation where companies can't prevent people from leaving at this point or from closing their doors because of all the situation that's happened. So that aspect of the company has had to kind of lay in wait a little bit until we are finished with whatever this is we are doing with COVID. Yeah, we don't even know what to name it right now. (laughs) Exactly. We're in between stage. I'm sure there'll be many case studies. We'll have all kinds of names about what's happening right now. Absolutely. The COVID effect. That's pretty much what it is. Yes. As far as the um, sports line, the athletic clothing wear comes from, it's called Premium Alpha Sportswear, and we are in the trademark phases right now with the federal government as far as getting all the paperwork and such done with that, and hopefully that will be out shortly. It's been a project that I've been working on in the last year. I love cycling, huge cyclist, so wanted to kind of develop something that was going to be comfortable for myself as well while riding. I know everybody likes to give us grief about the spandex, but the spandex is functional, and so it, right. <laughs> it works out very well. But it's a really neat project that I've been working on, and the proceeds from that are going to go to help fund the children's books that I write and uh, the stories that are created from that for the children that um, are in schools that I work with that are Title I schools. And that's all part of our being socially responsible to our society that we live in to ensure that we can help those. So I do a lot of volunteer work on on top of all of these other things that I do, Um, helping kids to read and to learn a little bit more about the world that's outside of their their geographical neighborhood. Okay. For now, we'll focus on your consulting, okay? So how did you develop the mission for what you were planning to do? Honestly, when I graduated from college, my only thought was I was going to find me a job as a professor somewhere Mm -hmm. in a university. I was going to pull up to that desk and I was going to literally die in that chair. That was my (laughs) that was my goal. (laughs) I didn't have anything else that I wanted to do. And I wanted to get the position in the university. But because I wasn't getting any interviews or getting responses from anyone, I had to come up with another idea. And at this point, I was still working as a social worker and I was not happy. So I had a peer in school ask me if I would look at her paper for her. And I thought, okay, fine, I can do that. So I started looking and working a little bit with some of the students, but it was very minimal stuff. But I word got out that what I was doing was helping and it was causing them, you know, they were getting out of school faster. There weren't any delays. So more people started asking me to help. And it got to a point where it started to interfere with what I was doing as a social worker. And I had to choose. And at that point, I had to get serious about what exactly is it that I am doing here? So I jumped on the internet and I began to ask Dr. Google, (laughs) what what should I look at as far as my mission? What should I look at as far as my next steps? And begin to put together some things. I used a lot of things that I found on the internet, but I also had enough sense to know that some of these things were not my forte. So what I needed to do was I needed to find people that were able to do these things, such as building my mission, such as getting out and coming up with handbooks for rules of what I needed to do, you know, things that would help me be able to function a little bit smoother. And of course, at the time, it was just me. And my son, who uh, works in IT, was drafted into the mission with me, so (laughs) whether he wanted to be there or not. And so it kind of started from there. So I had to kind of figure out what exactly was I doing. And in the beginning, I was doing no more than trying to get from point A to point B, which was the client needed this information, assistant with this information, and I needed to get paid. 
And so I needed to figure out how to bridge that gap. And that's what I eventually did. I remember the, the first month of doing this, I left my social work job and I literally was like, I don't have any money if this just does not work. I have no idea what I'm going to do. But I kind of let that part go. And I um, first month, 30 days into it, no paychecks, no nothing. And on the 30th day, I was able to gleam enough clients to where I was able to net about $15,000. And I was like, woo, talk about last minute stuff. But thank you. You know, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was really happy about that. So from there, once I had that pressure off of me, I was able to sit down and really start to map out some of the things that I needed to have in order to make this a successful organization, one that I would want to work at. And that's where we were born. So you made two really good points I want to revisit. And that first one was about you knew what you wanted to do, but you also recognized that there were some areas that you needed help. And when you were talking about, you know, creating that vision and, and finding people to support you, to help where you were weak. Could you revisit that part? Oh, absolutely. First off, I have a business degree. That's not an accounting degree. And I knew that I needed someone to help me with my books to what I was able to manage the money that I was making. And then also I needed a way to earn money that was outside of the consulting firm as well. And then on top of that, I needed people to help me put all these little pieces together. I don't do much with marketing, so I needed to find out where could I go to get logo stuff? I needed to know where could I get some catchy phrases? You know, I need to get some video stuff put together. Those weren't things that I did personally. So I had to kind of reach out and find out what was a good thing that I could do in order to, to find the people that I can put in my corner to do these things. I didn't need to employ them full time. I just needed to have them do project work for me. And that's pretty much what I did. Facebook has been an amazing tool for me. And with Facebook, I found my accountant to, through Taylor Tax, and he's been with me for several years. And then I've had a Fiverr, which I've been able to go out and get logo information, marketing stuff, help me with video, things that I need to put together, commercial stuff. So I've gotten all of that from Fiverr, which is a, a phenomenal website where you have all, all of these people that have this talent that you don't have and you can go out and get them for a reasonable price and not have to spend thousands of dollars on it. I also have a financial consultant that I was able to track down to help me work my money that I did receive. And that's Kelsey Wilcox. And she's uh, an investment advisor with Wealthwave and uh, phenomenal. So the money that I'm making, I'm able to put away for even retirement and be able to prepare for myself as well as be able to have additional monies that I may need to do other avenues, other projects that come along. So Kelsey has been, you know, phenomenal in that respect. So these are things that I didn't have that knowledge in. And so reaching out to folks that do have that knowledge, you know, you know who to employ when it's necessary is very important in being able to maintain your business. The moment you think that you can do everything is the moment that you're losing because you're not going to have the time to do everything. And so, I mean, I reach out to those that can help me do that. And that rolls right into the other part that stood out to me. You started your business, left your social work job, and then there was that lapse in income. And I feel like when people get into that space, it really drives them. I, I have to make this work. Right. Right. I had to eat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you might have those doubts and everything, but when it comes down to it, you have to make that work. So I think that kind of gives you an extra little push. Right. Yes. There's nothing like making sure that you don't starve to death that <laughs> motivates you to, to, to get out and do something. I mean, seriously, there, there have been days when I actually thought about driving for Uber <laughs> because I was like, mm, we got to figure out how we're going to maintain this. Yeah. Let's fill in the gap. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's going to happen here. But when I look back on all of this stuff and I think about when I first started, there were a lot of days when I was sweating because I had so much self doubt of my own, but I also had everybody around me tell me that I wasn't going to make it. And I had to be able to fight through all of that. So when you have your naysayers, th those are the ones that you're fighting against to show them, I, I can do this. I can make this work. But if you go into it with, well, if he doesn't think I can do it, I guess I can't do it, then you'll never succeed. I mean, you have to spend your time knowing that you're more than good enough and that you can make this work. 
And that's literally the attitude I had to take because everybody around me thought this was a crazy idea. How in the world are you gonna help all these doctors? But you just got out of school yourself. How do you know how to do all these things? And you learn, you develop things. I mean, I know that what I needed when I was in school and I didn't have it. So I literally made a company for college students to give them everything I thought I needed that would help get them through this process. And 150 students later have been successful at it. I think that's a big feat. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's not something everyone can say. So, you know, you work hard at it. And then it allows me to do other things. It allows me to do the volunteer work. It allows me to sit around and dream about what kind of bike shorts I want to wear and then develop a whole program around it. I mean, it, it allows me to do all kinds of things. I get to travel. I get to live a great life because of it. There's nothing wrong with it. Oh, no. We've been speaking to Dr. Wanda Presley about entrepreneurship and creative vision. We'll be right back. Do you want to start your own business or work for a startup? American Public University has bachelor's and master's degrees to teach you about ideation, marketing, management, and much more. Learn from highly experienced entrepreneurs. Apply today at study at APU.com. And we're back with Dr. Wanda Presley. We're talking about entrepreneurship and creative vision. So it sounds like some of the naysayers may have been one of the challenges that you faced. What are some of the other ones? Oh, some of the other challenges... When I started to grow, I knew I couldn't do everything by myself. So I had to figure out, so who's going to help me? I need to hire some people. But this is a virtual company. And so with it being virtual, I had to figure out how am I going to be able to maintain and oversee them? And I would think that that's been one of my biggest challenges is dealing with people on the Internet and not them not being truthful about everything. So I've had more than my share of staff members that have said they've done something and they haven't. Now, I've had some great staff members too. Now, don't get me wrong. I've had some wonderful doctors that have worked with me and have done great jobs and I loved it. But I've also, on the other side of that, had those that have not. And so being able to oversee that and be able to maintain things, that's where I would say one of my biggest challenges are. Because, you know, when you're dealing with human behavior and people can either do the right thing or not, and you have no control over that, and you don't know that they're not going to do the right thing until it's not done. And then that's when you have to deal with things. So I had a young lady that she was employed with me for a while and found out that she just wasn't doing what she needed to do. And she didn't have all the skills that she claimed she did. And so she talked a good game, though. She talked a really good game. And having to wade through that with clients that were on timelines, and it was, a, it was a real struggle because in the end, it's the client that loses if we can't meet these timelines. So I had to let her go, but I also had to, you know, to really talk to her because I felt that she had been in the same position that several of the clients are in. So there has to be some sort of compassion and there was just none. And so from that point on, I've had to be very cautious of who I do employ and then what type of overseeing that I do, because I've always been the type of manager to where, OK, here's the assignment. I need to get this done by this date. And as long as you're making your deadlines, I'm good. You know, I don't stand over you. I'm not trying to harass you to death because I think that you have a, an ability already, if you've earned the doctorate, to be able to do a lot of these things. And so I just found that some people are definitely in need of that handholding, but this is not the organization to do it with. I mean, I really need to have people that are independent and are able to move forward and get things done without me having to stand over them. So how have you worked through that when you get someone that has misrepresented themselves to do what you've asked them to do? How do you um, better screen these people? I now do more of a comprehensive training than I did before. And I require them to go through this training, which can last up to six months. And there's a lot of handholding and joint sessions that we do with the clients now, as opposed to allowing them to just go off and do it on their own. And that way I can see if they are following through and doing what they need to do during that time. Six months is a long time. And if you, you're you gonna hold out and do good work for six months and then not continue after that, you got a deeper issue than not being able to do this job. So, 
So just hold on to them a little bit longer, closer to the vest as far as the work that we get done. So in my employment, I have the other PhDs, I have the writing specialists, and then I have elementary school teachers, believe it or not. <laughs> and the reason why I have them is because I have a lot of clients that have English as a second language. So we are building up their understanding of the English language from the beginning, something that they didn't have the primary education here in the U.S. So we're giving that to them as they're going through their coursework to help them be able to write better out the gate, other than us having to do such strong handholding once they get to the doctoral program piece of it. Okay. Were there any other challenges? Other challenges? You know, dealing with finances of it is always an issue. I had a lot of college students come to me and say, you know, I really need your service, but I can't afford it. So how do I, <laughs> how do I deal with that? <laughs> You know, and so I had to figure out how to deal with that, because if I didn't, basically, I was not going to have a clientele. So I do my very best to try to come up with payment plans and different programs that they're able to finance things through. Or if there's something I can do that's a smaller service, I'll try to do that. So it just really just depends on, you know, what the situation is. I do my very best to help as many people as I can. Oftentimes, if I have a client that comes to me that pays for their service, but they never show up, you know, which believe it or not does happen, I often take the time that's been paid for. And if I have someone that um, is in need of a scholarship, I will turn that into a scholarship in a sense because I can't force you to come and work on your degree. Because if I got to do all of that, then, you know, my degree is hanging on the right, wall. I have you have mine. to be the one that <laughs> right. has to go after and want your degree. And so I can't fix that. But if you've already paid for something and you're just choosing not to use it, then that's on you. And so I do try to take those funds and do other things with them. That's really admirable. Your social work just keeps on shining through. I know that you had those tough cases back in the day that you wanted to get away from, but I mean, the care and time and effort that you put into your interactions with those students, it's still there. Yes. I mean, I really do believe that you have to be kind in, in everything that you do. So regardless of what is going on, I try to do my very best to treat people as, as well as I would like to be treated as myself. Absolutely. So how do you feel about your decision to become an entrepreneur? Oh, my goodness. It's the best thing I ever did because I can't imagine working for anybody else other than myself. I'm tough to work for my own self, but <laughs> it's <laughs> I really enjoy what I do. Like I said, it, it allows me the opportunity to do a lot of things that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. For example, my daughter, who's in the Army, she lives in uh, South Carolina, and I'm on the other side of the world in New Mexico. So there have been several times where I've had to go and help out with my grandson. And had I been stuck in a traditional job, I would have never been able to make those kinds of choices to be able to pick up and move. But because all I need is an internet connection, I'm able to travel all over the world and be able to still live and do the things that I want to do, whether I'm across the street or around the world. So being an entrepreneur has given me an open door to do whatever I want, wherever I want, and when I want, which is what I really enjoy the most about it. Finally, what is your advice for other women who are considering a unique business venture? Just do it. All I can say is just do it. Nothing else is going to happen, but you can fail, and then you just do it again. And just keep doing it. If you're going to make anybody's dreams come true, you, they might as well be your own rather than making someone else's dreams come true. And I really encourage everyone that works for me at some point for them to get out, to branch out and to do something that they're able to venture into as far as their own business as well. Because there is nothing like working for yourself. It has given me financial freedom to be able to provide for my grandchildren, to provide for my kids, and to have the things that I want. I, I just think you should just do it. We get so caught up in just working and getting a paycheck every two weeks, but you can still do those same things. I, I have health insurance. I have a wonderful 401k. I have all of these things because there are people that are out there that provide these services to the entrepreneur. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't have the same benefits you have at work that you have 
working for yourself. And I, I think that that's the one thing that scares most of us because, you know, women, we rule the world. And so we have a lot of responsibilities on our hands. And because of that, you know, we're a little bit less likely to step out on that ledge to just test the waters of success. But I'm the person that I will jump off the cliff because I know how to fly. And so I'm not worried about it. And I, I've been successful, yes, but when I walked out that first day and I had that first month of no income, all I kept saying to myself was, I've got to make this work. There is no other option. And so I just kept trying and trying and trying until I was able to be successful at it. And that's no different than what I do every single day now. When at the end of each year, I sit down with a piece of paper and I say, okay, what can I do better for next year? What can I do better in 2021? I'm very proud of the fact that I'm one of the, probably one of the few small businesses that did not require any assistance from the government. I actually gave raises and bonuses out this year, <laughs> despite COVID. And because we, we've been successful across the board in every aspect of what we do, and not just getting the work done, but I've also taken care of my people. This was the one time that they definitely needed my help because of all the things that were going on. And so I needed to make sure that I was there and I was available for them because that's what you're supposed to do if you're a good manager and what you're doing. That's excellent. That's excellent advice to just do it. I know sometimes when we deal with the imposter syndrome, we deal with, oh, I'm not able to take that leap. I'm not sure. But sometimes you really just have to go for it. And like you said, you have to make it work. So you will make it, you will make it work. Exactly. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, Dr. Presley, and having this much needed conversation. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. For more information about our university, visit us at studyatapu.com. APU, American Public University.